You know, all over the Arab world, uh, Jesus has given a dream to people. He's given dreams to people, and, and they're coming to know Jesus through that dream. Isn't that powerful? Aren't you glad to have a part in helping these kind of ministries like Run? Amen? So awesome. So blessed to get to share with you today from our series on Mastering Now. You know, everybody say now. We can't do a whole lot about yesterday, but we can do something today. We can do something now that will cause tomorrow's, our tomorrow to be more blessed and more bright. Amen? I know we're all looking forward to having our best year ever in 2019, and there's no time like today, no time like now to set things in motion to do that. It's so good to see you. Isn't it good to be in God's house? I mean, there's no better place to be this morning than with God's, God's people in God's house. Amen. So good to see you. You know, a few years ago, my mom began to notice some issues with her home. She's got a beautiful townhouse in southwest Houston right by the Galleria, which makes me very happy because I like to shop. <laughs> but she started to notice the floor was beginning to shift and becoming uneven. There were big cracks that were beginning to appear in her stairwell. And her neighbor's home, of course, they were, you know, right by her because it's a townhouse. They were fine. You know, they didn't have any of the shifting or the cracks going on. So my mom called the car contractor to find out, you know, what was going on with her house. And they began to uh, investigate, and they found out what the problem was. They discovered that underneath her foundation was an in-ground pool. It had been covered up instead of removed. It wasn't covered with just dirt, but it was covered with all kinds of junk metal and debris. So she had to move out for three months and they had to do extensive work on her foundation. Lots of time and lots of money. And at 82 years old, she wasn't too happy about that, right? But basically the foundation wasn't right for the structure that had been built on it. No matter how much she tried to fix the floor, patch and paint the walls the, the, over the cracks, they were going to come back because they were not the problem. They were just symptoms of a deeper issue, and it was a faulty foundation. You know, I think that we can all look at life, and we can look at culture, we can look at our world, and, and we see the same kind of thing going on. There's been a shift in our values and morals and our belief system. We see cracks in a lot of places in our personal lives, some of us, in our marriages. Families are being redefined. There's confusion about gender and sexuality. We see cracks in the political, the social, the, the racial areas of life, and we spend a lot of effort really trying to fix uh, the problem, uh, trying to fix them, patch over them, a lot of time, a lot of effort, but really they're just symptoms of a deeper problem, and that's a foundation that needs repaired. It's a foundation that's faulty. But you know, Jesus tells us in Matthew 7 how to fix our foundations in life. Aren't you glad today? I know I'm glad that Jesus is in the foundation repair business. Amen? He knows how to do it. And Matthew 5 through 7, Jesus preached what is called the Sermon on the Mount. This is said to be his greatest sermon ever. Do you know why it was called the Sermon on the Mount? I'll tell you why. It was preached on a mountain. You know, sometimes those things just go over our head, but that's what it was. It was preached on a mountain. That was his greatest sermon. And one, of the, one, one that Jesus preached, not just to everybody, he preached it to his disciples, those who were followers and not just fans of Jesus. You know, there were lots of fans, spectators in Jesus' day. They would show up to watch him perform miracles and healings and bring great teachings. But then there were those who wanted to be in the game. They weren't watching. They were walking. They wanted to walk with Jesus. They were serious about Jesus changing changing their life. And how many of you know today, I think we're in a room today where Jesus wants to change our life. Amen. How many of you believe you're, you're not just a fan, but 2019, you're going to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to let him change our life. So in this sermon, Jesus was talking to them basically about how to live a life that honors God and is blessed. And, and this is how he ends it in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 through 26. Let's read it. It says, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine, and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rains descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. 
So Jesus ends this great sermon, best ever, with this illustration about our foundations. Let's talk about it just a few minutes. Both of these men shared the same dream, and that was the dream of building a house. Nobody, uh, a house in Scripture refers to a life. It refers to a personal life. You know, nobody wants to fail at building a life. We want to be successful in our relationships. We want to be successful in our career. We want our, health, our, our bodies to be healthy and strong and our emotions to. How many of you have already been to the gym this year? Okay, we're working on it, aren't we? But nobody wants to fail at building a life. It also refers to a family. We hear the scripture. We hear in scripture about the house of David. You know, we all, want, we all have homes that we care deeply about. We don't go into marriage planning a ruined relationship. We go planning to live happily ever after. We don't have kids thinking they'll be difficult sometimes and rebellious. They look like such angels when they're born. What happens? <laughs> We have a dream of building a beautiful life and a beautiful family. Then God's church is called a house. It's called the house of God, the household of faith. Aren't you thankful to be a part of a community of faith, to have people around you today that are spurring you on to to walk with God, in your faith with God, in your walk with God? Would you turn to somebody today, turn to your neighbor and tell them, I am here to spur you on? (laughs) In, okay. <laughs> In Scripture, some of you are telling them how you're ready to spur them on, right? <laughs> In Scripture, building a house also referred to building a society, a nation. of the, the nation of Israel was called the House of Israel. That was a nation. We call it the White House, the House of Congress. We're connected as citizens to this nation, and we're praying for for this house to be healed and to be blessed, amen? But all of us should feel a responsibility to four of those houses, to our personal life, to our family, to our church, and to our nation. So both of these men were building a house. Everybody say house. Secondly, both of these men heard the words of Jesus. To hear in Scripture means to give audience to. They sat under the same teacher. They sat under the same great teaching. So both had a house, Both heard, and then both had a hurricane. It wasn't just a little thunderstorm. This was rain, flooding, and winds that blew and beat against the house. This was a Harvey kind of storm. Wouldn't it be nice if following Jesus meant no more storms, no more rain, and no more wind in life, only blue skies and sunny days? Sounds good, doesn't it? (laughs) That would be awesome, but it's not a reality, and we know that. Jesus said to his followers, in this world, you're going to have trouble. How many of you are still in the world today, okay? How many, uh, we know we're going to have trouble if we're in the world. The scripture says many of the afflictions of the righteous. Job said, man born of woman is few days and full of trouble. If you've got a belly button today, you're going to have some trouble, right? Jim reminds us of that often. Storms are in Scripture rec- represent negative events that impact our lives. Storms don't care who we are, how much money we have, or education we have. They don't care what position we hold in life. They just show up. They just invade our lives. Storm, financial storms, physical, mental storms, marital storms, ministry storms, national storms. Some of you today are in one of those storms. I know you are because I know some of your stories. One of you have a situation today that, you, you know, you're waiting on the doctor's direction because you've gotten a bad report. A couple of you are dealing with a difficult divorce today. One of you is a, is a family that a, a, a child has, has gone the wrong direction, and you're praying and believing God for that child, but you are in a storm. You're in a storm today. We all face storms in our life. These men had some things in common, but there was one thing that was different. One man heard the words and practiced it. The other man heard it, and he didn't practice it. Jesus called one wise and the other foolish. Wisdom is this. Wisdom is the decision to apply biblical truth to real life. Foolishness is the refusal to apply biblical truth to real life. God has given us a handbook that applies to real life. There's not one part of living that God, hasn't, that God has left out of his book. Aren't you thankful for the scriptures today? Amen. The Bible says that God sent him to heal us and to deliver us from our destruction. The scripture says it's in him, in his word, that all things hold together. 
He's told us how to have marriages, homes, business, um, businesses, emotions, communities, nations that hold together. But it takes more than us just hearing it. It takes us doing it. How many of you have kids that are good hearers, but they're not so good at doing the doing part, right? I had four of those. No. <laughs> you know, we've all seen the motion detector lights, haven't we? You use those kind of lights when you, you know, when you don't want to waste electricity. You get tired of people leaving lights on or them being left on at the office or in the home or at the workplace. So these lights come on only when somebody walks into the room. The power is there, but it's not activated till somebody moves. You know, in the Bible, we see that over and over again. God would have his people act before they experienced his power before they experienced it, what, what he was able to do. The Red Sea didn't divide till Moses acted and lifted, it up, lifted up his rod over the sea. The Jordan River didn't part until the priest acted and put their toes into the water. Lazarus didn't come out of the grave until Martha acted and rolled away the stone. Peter didn't, di didn't get a boatload of fish until he acted and threw his net on the other side of the boat. God is waiting on us to act on his word so he can show us what he can do. Amen. He's got some pretty awesome things that he wants to do in our lives. How many of you believe that this morning? Amen. It takes both hearing and it takes acting. You know, we can't act on something that we don't know to do. Unless we, if we're going to act on something, we got to hear, hear about what to act on, don't we? So, Faith Family, thank you for being here today to hear God's Word. You have made yourself, you've put yourself in, an, in the audience to hear God's Word. Thank you for being here to do that today. I tell you, I know it blesses God's heart to see you here hungry for His Word. The Scripture says we have to continue to hear so that we don't forget. How many of you, like me, forget what the Word says sometimes? Sometimes Jim has to remind me about the Word of God. He has to remind me about what I'm supposed to be doing. Sometimes my, don't say that. He said amen. <laughs> Sometimes my kids have to remind me. You know, when you teach your kids the scriptures, get ready because they'll straighten you out with it sometimes. One of mine did that to me the other day and I was so thankful. <laughs> after, after a while. <laughs> So we have to continue to hear God's word. So, so that's why we get up in the morning, don't we? We don't get up to be religious. We get up in the morning, take our Bibles out because we want to hear God's word. When we read God, we hear God. When we read God, he talks to our heart. He talks to us about the situations in our life. That's why we come together like this, to give audience to the word of God. The scripture says the church is the storehouse where we find meat that matures and makes us strong. How many of you are looking forward to some meat after to, for some meat after today, right? Those of us who've been on the fast. Woo, Whataburger, here we come. <laughs> I know there's some people looking forward today to, to God doing some really great things in your life in 2019. Let's talk about right now how God uses his word to build a firm foundation in our life. Second Timothy gives us four ways. You know, when I sit in church, I like to go home with practical stuff that I can do. I love to hear great messages, but I want you to give me something I can take home and start to do. Amen. So that's what I'm going I'm to give you today. Second, and Pastor Jim always gives us that. He does a great job. Give him a hand. Amen. Awesome, awesome word. Always. Second Timothy gives us four ways we can act on Scripture to bring blessing and stability to our lives. Verse 16 says this. It says, all Scripture is God-breathed. Just think about that for a minute. Every Scripture in the Bible has the breath of God on it. It's got God's life on it. It's alive. But all Scriptures God-breathed, it's useful to teach, to rebuke, to correct, and train us in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. We want to be thoroughly equipped for everything that comes our way. Amen? The word teaching in, in the King James Version is also the word doctrine. And doctrine is a body of truth that helps us know what to believe about God and about life. It's what we can base and build our lives on. The doctrine of God's word answers so many questions for us about God and life. It answers the question of creation. Where did we come from? We didn't come from apes, amen? God created us, the Bible says, male and female. Not only us, he created the universe. It wasn't the Big Bang Theory or some other scientific explanation. Genesis clearly lays out that God, cre God created the universe in six days. 
God's doctrine explains our dilemma. It lets us know that we're not intrinsically good in the center of all things, but we are sinners in need of a Savior. I don't have a hard time believing that I need a Savior. Do you? How many of you don't have a hard time believing your spouse needs a Savior? If you're not going to say you do, I'm a... We all need a Savior. It shows us the battle between good and evil, God and Satan, the church and the world. It talks about life on earth and life after the earth. It makes clear that we're not going to exist in in nothingness somewhere when we die or that we're going to come back as something or somebody else. It makes us clear. It teaches us that we will live in the presence of God or outside of the presence of God for all eternity. The doctrine of God's Word brings clarity. It eliminates so much of the confusion we have in life about God and about our own life. Jesus said, I didn't, didn't say this. He didn't say, I am a way, I am a truth, and I am a life. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. When we embrace it as truth, I tell you, it creates a foundation of strength and stability. We can know what we believe. Amen? We can know what we believe. As parents, our kids can know what they believe. We can put foundations in the hearts of our kids. Paul said to Timothy in the verse before this, he said, From a child, Timothy, you've known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation. I tell you, our kids don't have to go off to college and get all confused and messed up. They can have a foundation that keeps them in truth. Amen. Our mission statement in Kids Church is to build godly foundations for incredible futures. Isn't that awesome? How many of you want that kind of a foundation in the heart of your kids? Amen. Grandkids. I know some of you are raising grandkids, and we salute you for that. Let's give all of our grandparents who are raising kids a good hand. They're awesome. Pastor Tony and his team are doing a great job. They're not out there babysitting, but they're teaching our kids the truth about who God is and about who they are in God, and we need to give them a good hand, too. Could we do that? All of our nursery workers, all of our children's workers, we thank God for them. God not only uses doctrine, but he uses reproof of his word to bring stability. To reprove means to be made aware of the wrong path so we can be set on the right path. A few years ago, Jim and I were coming back, and actually Sarah and and Eli were with us, and we were coming back from a meeting in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and we stopped to get lunch and then got back on the road. After about an hour, we looked up and saw that we were going the wrong way, and I was not driving. (laughs) We were, headed back to, we, we were headed back to Baton Rouge instead of Victoria, Texas. So my husband turned the car around and got back on the right path so, so, we, so we could get to our destination, which was Victoria, Texas. But listen. Oh, boy. <laughs> Keep going. See, God wants to help us stay on the right path. So we get to the destination he has for us in life. He's got a plan to take us some pretty awesome places. You know, we watch all the commercials on TV about those cruises and all those great destination places, and we think, wow, those places are amazing. How much do they cost? But let me tell you something. God has a better destination than that. Amen. He wants to take us places that will bless us beyond what we could even imagine. Amen. But we got to stay on the right path. When we come to God, we're made right in him positionally. We're right with God. Our hearts are right with God, but practically we still have a lot of areas in our life that be, that that need to be made right. I do. I know that. I need, I need lots of areas in my life that God still needs to make right. Areas that need to be turned around so that I can head in the direction that he has for me in life. You know, a lot of us grew up learning ways of living and doing things that we thought were okay. Uh, But then we started hearing God's word and we find out they're not. That God's word says something different than what we're doing. Maybe we grew up thinking it's okay to get angry and upset and let somebody have it whenever we feel like it in life. How many of you just know sometimes that feels good to do that, right? Just does. But listen, then we come across the scripture that says, let everyone, everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. And we have to decide in that moment, are we going to do it or are we just going to hear it? What are we going to do? Maybe we always believe that Sunday morning is my day. Don't anybody bother me. It's a day of rest. I'm going to sleep as long as I want, and I'm going to do whatever I want today. Then you get to church, and you hear Pastor Jim speaking on Hebrews 4, which says, don't, 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 don't get out of the habit of coming together and, and, and being together and encouraging each other in God's house. And, and, and I'm not talking to you today because you're here, right? 
you're here, you're in the right place today, but we have to decide in that moment, you know, are we going to stay on, on our path? Are we going to keep going our way? Are we going to go God's path? You know, the scripture says when he reproves us through instruction, it's the way to life. It's the way to blessing and to building a house that stands whatever comes our way. God is not trying to take the fun out of our life. Not at all. He's trying to put us on a path that will bless us and fulfill us more than, than that of anything else in life. So how many of you say in 2019, you're going to let God keep you on the path toward his destiny? Amen. He's taking you some good places. He's got good things ahead. Then the scripture goes on to say that another way that we can act to bring stability to our foundation is through correction. The word correction is made up of three Greek words, which means this. It means to make straight again. To make straight again. No, that's four words, but anyway. To make straight again. It's made up of three words that mean to make straight again. It has to do with bringing correction to the doctrines or beliefs that we hold about God and his word. You know, I, I, I think that probably all of us have had, had things in life that we were taught, you know, maybe from kids or from grandparents or, or we, we picked up about God that we thought were right. And we begin, uh, you know, we thought were right maybe about his, his, his word or just, just about life. And, you know, but then we begin to study God's Word, and we find out they, they aren't in line with God's Word. They're not in line with the character of God. I remember thinking when I was a little girl that you had to be baptized seven times. I got the story of Naaman, who, was, who had leprosy and had to dip in the Jordan seven times mixed up with baptism. I was so glad when I found out you only had to be baptized one time, right? But Jesus, you know, he got on to the religious leaders and said, you teach his doctrine the commandments of men. In other words, uh, you know, you're making up your own rules and you're calling it God. That happens to us sometimes, doesn't it? We believe things that are not really in line with God's truth. And we need to know what God's word says for ourselves. The Berean people in the Bible, the Bible says we're more noble because they received Paul's message eagerly. And they examined the scriptures to see that it was true. You know, Pastor Jim is okay with you taking the notes home and the scriptures home and studying the scriptures for your, yourself. Actually, that's a healthy thing to do. Amen? It's healthy to study the truth about who God is and what, he, and what he knows. He knows how to fix our theology if it's off. We know that if a truth, if truth can set us free, then a lie can keep us in bondage, Right? A lie can keep us bound in an area of our life. It will keep us from knowing fully who God is and what he wants to do in our life. My da dad had a sister. Her name was Aunt, Aunt Mary. She was a wonderful lady. She was a good Christian. She loved God. She taught Sunday school most of her life. But right around when I was born, my dad got a call that she was really, really sick. She had become bedridden and mentally not there. She would have to have 24-hour nurse's care, couldn't feed herself, couldn't take care of herself. My, herself. my dad had no idea that she was in this kind of shape, that she was this bad. The Lord spoke to him to drive to Dallas and go and pray for her. Well, he was a Baptist pastor that had just received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and he was on fire. He would pray for anything that didn't move. But, you know, this was all still really new to him, even though he was excited. So he said, God, if this is really you, speak to me and just show me something from Scripture. And he opened his Bible and he pointed. Now, how many of you have done that? I've done that before. Jim tells about a preacher that did that one time. He did it twice. He opened the Bible, pointed, and it said, um, it said Judas hung himself. Opened it up again, pointed again. It said, go thou and do likewise. <laughs> So how many of you know, you got to be, gotta be careful. You can get in trouble when you do that. But I think, I think God honored his faith. And so he opened his Bible. He knew he was new at this. And, and, and he put his finger on a verse and it said this. It said, fear not, Mary, for you have found favor with God. So that's all it took for him. He drove to Dallas 90 to nothing. He walked into her room. He was so shocked by what he saw. Her hair was all matted. She was glassy-eyed. She was mumbling. She wasn't making any sense. She didn't even know who he was. He couldn't even, he said if he would have seen her on the streets of Dallas, he wouldn't even have known that it was his, that she was his sister. And this holy anger came over him. The room was dark and depressing. He went over and pulled open the shades and said, God is light. Let light into this room. And then he said these words, which are important. He said, don't tell me God did this to my sister. Long story short, he prayed for her. That day, my Aunt Mary got out of bed. She walked, she talked, she fed herself for the first time in, in, in months. She was healed from that day forward and never suffered with that illness again. But... 
But let me tell you why that happened, because you can't really appreciate that till you hear this. She had been taught that God put sickness on you to teach you something. She believed that she was suffering because it was God's will. Her pastor probably was doing the best he could, but that's what he taught. That's what she learned in her church. But when she said later, she said, when my dad said to her, don't tell me God did this to my sister, she heard it on the inside. She, she began to think, maybe God didn't do this to me. Maybe he's not putting this sickness on me, and it unlocked something on the inside of her. Truth exposed a lie, and that's why she became free. Amen? We want the truth of God's word to straighten out anything that's keeping us from experience who God, experiencing who God is and what he can do in our life. We want the truth of God's word uh, to, to bring freedom to who we are. How many of you know sometimes in our own person, our own personality, we need to, we need to tr know the truth about who God says we are, amen, so we can be free. Aren't you thankful for a church that teaches God's truth? I love it. Then lastly, it says the word is useful to train us in righteousness. And the word train refers to maturing or training a child. These are four different, completely different words. It refers to maturing or training a child. It includes guidance and discipline. When we become a Christian, the scripture says we are born again or born into the family of God. You know, when something is born, it's a baby, right? It's not mature. We start this Christian life as babies that have to grow and mature in God. Babies cry a lot. Babies make messes. They fall down a lot when they're trying to walk. Why? Because they're babies. That's all that they know how to do. I'm fixing to get a baby in my life, and I'm pretty excited about the crying and the messing and all of it, right? I don't care. I'm just excited. But babies, that's all they can do. Just like we have a natural family that supports us while we grow and, and takes care of us, God has given us a spiritual family, a church called the church, a local church where we can be supported and cared for as we learn to walk out this life of faith. He gives us mothers and fathers in the faith who will guide us, who will help, uh, help bring discipline and maturity into our lives. He gives us brothers and sisters who will walk with us, not discourage us, but they will encourage us. They will pray for us. You know, last night, Jim and I, I stopped by one of our wonderful ladies' houses, and she's going through a storm in her marriage. And we got to her house, and there was another one of our ladies there, and, and it blessed us so much. She'd been through the same thing that she'd been through, and same kind of difficulty. And it just, it just encouraged us to see these two walking together through this storm. How do you know there's nobody that can encourage you like somebody who's been there in the same situation you've been in? The Scripture says when truth, and Pastor Tony mentioned it today, when truth is spoken in love, we grow up as we're joined to the body of Christ. So two things it takes to grow and to be healthy. It takes the, the truth of God's word, and it takes connection to the body of Christ. It takes connection to, to a church family. Amen. I love what I read recently in a book that we're studying in staff. Uh, it says in John 3 that Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside where he spent time with him. That word spent is the same word as tarried, and it's made up of two words that mean to rub against. Jesus wanted to rub off on his disciples. He wanted his life to impact their life. They were going to carry out his work on the earth, and he was spending time with them so he could rub off on them. You know, as we look around this room today, uh, we, we, can, we can see people, I know I can, that I want their life to rub off on me. Amen. Their life as a Christian is inspiring. It's going the direction we want to go. They have a marriage that's flourishing. They have, a, they have kids that are growing up in God and they're flourishing. And, and you just want to hang out with these people, right? You want to learn from them. One of my friends here told me that when she was going through a difficult season, she told us all in Bible study that when she was going through a difficult season of her life, she would come to Bible study and she would just sit there uh, next, she would find one of the, the ladies, one of the, her mentors, and she would just sit next to her in church. She said, I didn't even need to talk to her. I didn't need to say anything she, to her. She said, I just felt like as I sat there, I was gaining strength from her. I was, I was just soaking up strength by being next to her. Amen? God wants us to rub off on each other. I saw two of our 20-somethings uh, last night worshiping God with all of their heart. Their hearts were so, their hands were up. They were surrendered, and it was the most beautiful thing. I thought if I came to church only to see that, that's good enough for me. Amen. It was so powerful. I tell you, as the older, more mature, we need to rub off on the younger. As the younger, we need some of their fire.
fire, their passion to rub off on us. Amen. We need to do this life together. That's why we have dream teams and connect groups and the different ways you can rub the shoulders with, you, with each other. We can get next to each other. So, uh, and that's why we do it. We can't do it alone, I tell you, but we can, do, we can help each other. Everybody say help. We can help each other hear and practice truth so we build the kind of foundations that weather the storms of life. Amen.